What if you learned that your whole life was a lie? That everything you thought you knew about your childhood, parents, and siblings was wrong? Well, for Paul Franzak, that's exactly what happened. For 48 years, he thought he knew his life story until he uncovered a massive family secret. And things only get more bizarre. The story I'm about to tell you is 100% real. Even I had a difficult time wrapping my head around the events that unfold. This, this story got me. And I think you'll find the same thing happening to you as you watch today's episode. I'm Brooke. Thanks for tuning in to Armchair Investigator. Today, we'll be exploring the life of a baby who was stolen from his parents 37 hours after he was born. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. It goes so much deeper. One thing I can promise you is that you'll walk away from this video with more questions than answers. On April 26th, 1964, Dora Franzak went into labor. And like any new mother, she was anxious to meet her new baby. But for Dora, this was an especially important time because she had previously lost a baby. Now, thankfully, Dora had a smooth delivery. Everything went as planned and the baby was healthy. That meant that at the first feeding, baby Paul would be brought into Dora's hospital room. Dora's nurse, Mary Trenchard, said Dora was on cloud nine and taking in the precious moments of seeing her baby for the first time. Things were a little different than they are today. Back then, after delivery, the baby was taken directly to the nursery and the mother was taken back to her room. They weren't yet doing things like skin-to-skin -skin contact. Michael Reese was a large, bustling hospital, and because Dora wasn't the only woman who had given birth, that meant her nurse had other patients she had to check on. The next day, on April 27, 1964, around 11 a.m., as Dora and her hospital roommate Joyce Doan, a 24-year-old woman who had also recently given birth to a son, were chatting. Their conversation was interrupted by a woman in a nurse's uniform. And while they thought it was a little strange that the woman entered the room, looked around, and then left without saying anything, it certainly wasn't enough to set off any alarms. And if you've ever been in a hospital, you'll know that nurses, doctors, and other staff members are often bouncing in and out of the rooms. At 1 o'clock p.m., baby Paul was brought into Dora's room for a feeding. As Nurse Mary is heading out, another nurse enters. Dora recognized her as the same nurse who had entered the room two hours earlier without saying anything. Dora said this nurse instructed her to feed her baby water from a bottle. The nurse stood over her shoulder and watched before announcing that the doctor was here to see her baby. Not thinking twice about it, Dora hands over her newborn and at 1.30 p.m., the nurse walks out with baby Paul wrapped securely in her arms. What nobody knew was that she had walked down four flights of stairs and exited the hospital through a back door. Meanwhile, Nurse Mary went about her shift business as usual. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary until she noticed that all of the babies were being taken out of the nursery. Hmm, that's odd. And then she gets paged to the nurse's office. What's all this about? The head nurse asks Mary if she's seen the Franzak baby. Mary tells her no. She's been assisting other mothers in the maternity ward. If Nurse Mary didn't have him, that meant he was gone, as in kidnapped. Mary is ordered to go back to Mrs. Franzak's room and stay with her. She's told not to leave her side until the doctor comes to see her, and she can't say anything to Dora about her missing baby. She's told to act as if nothing happened, and that's exactly what Nurse Mary does. She spends the next few hours chatting with Dora about motherhood, plans for the future, and accompanies her to her new mother classes that the hospital provided. All while staff search the building from top to bottom looking for baby Paul. There was almost a sort of private panic going on. A majority of the staff knew what had happened, but the patients and mothers in the maternity ward had no idea. The hospital didn't call police for an hour. It's like they expected baby Paul to just show up, as if someone had lost their keys. And this was before security cameras. See, security cameras didn't go mainstream until around 1972. 
Before then, it was just too expensive to use CCTV for security purposes, and companies had to pay someone to monitor the live video feed, something most businesses just couldn't afford. I keep thinking about Nurse Mary and what I would do if I were in her shoes. I'm not sure that I'd be able to keep quiet and act like everything's fine, but the alternative is having to watch this new mother just completely crumble and fall apart. It sounds like it was just easier to act normal and keep telling yourself that the baby would be found. It had to have been agonizing. Dora was enjoying the day, enjoying the classes, and kept talking about how excited she was to see her son again. But Nurse Mary, along with all the other nurses, knew that wasn't going to happen. At 2.30 p.m., police were called. At 3.30, Dora's doctor breaks the news. Mrs. Franzak, your baby has been taken. And with that, Dora's hospital room filled with policemen and FBI agents. The biggest manhunt in Chicago history was launched, involving 175,000 postal workers, 200 police officers, and the FBI. By midnight, they had searched 600 homes. But the likelihood of ever finding the woman who stole baby Paul was slim. Because police weren't notified for more than an hour, it gave the woman a good head start. Not only that, they had a difficult time explaining to the sketch artist what the woman looked like. In the end, all they had were a few generic details. The woman was white, thin, had shoulder-length brown hair, was between 35 and 45 years old, and was wearing a white uniform. When the sketch was released, calls from the public came pouring in. But none of them panned out. And because Michael Reese Hospital was situated on a hub, it was easy to get away from the area quickly. There was a train station nearby, an airport, not to mention major highways. The reality was, whoever stole baby Paul could be out of Chicago within five minutes, not to mention the more than one hour head start. A cab driver had come forward saying that he had given a ride to a woman who was holding a baby and matched the description police put out. She had asked him to take her to an area on 35th and Halstead, which was about 15 minutes from the hospital. From there, she got out of the cab and drove off in a different car. Had she been hanging out at the hospital, lying in wait for several hours, waiting for the perfect opportunity to take a baby? Had she been studying the nurses and patients? It appeared so. Dora would be moved to her own hospital room and kept for several days so that she could be monitored. At one point, the hospital brought her a filet mignon dinner, but there was no point. She was sickened by the events. An orderly reported that the meal was later taken away, cold and uneaten. With the snap of a finger, the Franzaks went from celebrating their new son to mourning him. Why has God done this to me again? She would cry. It was a year prior that she had been at Michael Reese Hospital where she would lose her first son, and now her second son too had been taken. The Franzaks took to the media to plead for their son's safe return. It was as if everyone in Chicago was sickened by what happened. A baby kidnapped from a hospital? How? The Daily Mail newspaper offered up a $10,000 reward. And in 1964, that was a lot of money. It was the kind of money that got people talking. To put it into perspective, it would have been the equivalent of almost $100,000 in 2023. So you can imagine everyone's shock when the reward didn't pre And with that, the Franzaks head back home without their baby. Despite the immense amount of pain, shock, and grief they were experiencing, Dora never gave up hope that she would see her son again. Mrs. Franzak, are you still convinced now that someday you will see little Paul Joseph again? Yes, I'm still convinced. Fifteen long months would go by with no word about baby Paul. And, in a way, the Franzaks found their new normal. But life has a way of throwing curveballs. On July 2nd, 1965, nearly 800 miles away in the bustling city of Newark, New Jersey, a toddler is found in a stroller on the sidewalk outside of a department store. Now, at first, nobody thought anything of it. 
Back then, it was somewhat common for parents to leave their babies in the stroller outside a store while they ran inside. So, in 1965, seeing the little boy alone in his stroller didn't cause concern. But after a while, those in the area noticed that he'd been out there for too long. Where were his parents? Concerned citizens called the police. A few things stood out to investigators right away. The boy was well-dressed wearing a blue suit, and the stroller he was in was high-end. He did have some bruising around his left eye and a cold, but other than that, the boy seemed to be in good health overall. Surely, frantic parents would be calling the police by the end of the day. But no calls about a missing boy came in. Days turned into weeks. Police were stunned. What they thought was going to be a simple open and closed case was proving to be much more difficult than they had imagined. The boy was sent to a nearby adoption home where he remained for eight months. And because nobody knew anything about him, the state allowed the adoption home to give him a new name. They settled on Scott McKinley. And thankfully, he was well taken care of and loved. The people who ran the adoption home loved Scott so much that they were considering adopting him. He brought so much joy and love into their home. Articles ran in both the Newark and New York City newspapers with information about the abandoned boy. With Newark and New York City being such large towns, police thought that tips would come pouring in, but they didn't. With nobody coming forward to claim Baby Scott, detectives in Newark reach out to detectives in Chicago about their missing baby from 1964. Could this be the same baby? Could the boy who was taken from Michael Reese Hospital be the same baby who was now abandoned in Newark? It was possible. DNA testing wasn't yet available. There were no records of Paul's blood type and the hospital hadn't taken his fingerprints or footprints. Ultimately, it was the shape of the boy's ears that led everyone to believe that he could be the Franzak baby. Authorities compared the shape of the boy's ears with the newborn photos of Paul and felt they were a match. If you're shaking your head in disbelief, you're not alone. Back then, it was believed that the shape of a person's ear was just as unique as a fingerprint. In 1963, the first patent for using the outer ear for identification purposes was granted. There's actually still strong arguments being made today about switching over to using the outer ear to ID a person as fingerprints can rub off or callous over. Authorities would test over 10,000 boys that they thought could be Baby Paul. The only one they couldn't positively rule out was Baby Scott. In March of 1966, detectives let Dora and Chester Franzak know they might finally have a lead on their missing son. They were stunned and over the moon with joy. Was this real? They couldn't get to New Jersey fast enough. The day the Franzaks were scheduled to meet with little Scott was a day filled with excitement and anticipation, but it was also tense. There was a lot riding on this meeting. Parents who had been looking for their missing child, a little boy who was abandoned, the adoption family who deeply cared for him, and the FBI and law enforcement who had spent thousands of hours on the two cases. If the Franzaks thought this little boy wasn't their son Paul, it would be back to the drawing board. When the state worker brought in Scott to meet Dora and Chester, there was silence. And then Dora yelled out, Oh my God, that's my baby. It was like a miracle. The Franzak family was whole again. The pause button could finally be lifted and they could start living. And that's exactly what they did for the next 48 years. In December of 1966, Judge James E. Murphy signs an adoption decree awarding custody of Scott McKinley to the Franzaks, with Scott's name being legally changed back to Paul Joseph Franzak. And Dora and Chester would never talk about what had happened. They just wanted to put the whole ordeal behind them. Not long after Paul was reunited with his parents, Dora gave birth to a second son, whom they named David. And while it was a joyous time, it was a big adjustment, what you would consider an ideal childhood. It was a happy one centered around family and lots of love. The Franzaks lived in a great neighborhood, and the boys were always outside playing. 
They were the family that took vacations every year and went all out for the holidays. At the age of 10, Paul would stumble upon a few boxes one day while snooping for Christmas presents in the basement crawl space. By the look of them, he knew they weren't presents, but curiosity got the best of him. What he saw in those boxes would alter the course of his life forever and expose a family secret. But he didn't know that yet. At first glance, they looked to be filled with old keepsakes. Looking closer, he saw old newspaper articles talking about a baby who had been kidnapped. And there were also articles talking about that same baby who was returned to his parents, as well as handwritten letters and sympathy cards. He found pictures of his parents and pictures of a little boy. The, the articles were about him. He was the missing baby. Wanting to know more, Paul immediately questioned his mother about what he'd found. And Dora, well, she was caught off guard. She never intended for Paul to find that information. Paul could tell she was visibly upset. All she would say was, you were kidnapped, we found you, we love you, we'll never talk about it again. And that was that. Not only was the door to the crawl space closed, but so was that conversation. The Franzaks remained a close-knit family, but as Paul and David entered their teen years, they naturally began to forge their own paths and explore their own interests. Paul developed a love for music and even taught himself how to play the bass guitar. He was outgoing and free-spirited, the type that was always up for an adventure. So, after graduating from high school, when he auditioned for the bass position in a band and they asked if he'd be willing to move, he jumped at the opportunity. It was bye-bye mom and dad and hello Arizona. Despite what had happened to him as a baby, he didn't experience that separation anxiety at the thought of moving 2,000 miles away from his family. None at all. In fact, he would become so absorbed in his life on the West Coast that he didn't talk to his parents for almost a year. Five years later, the band broke up and everyone would part ways. He returned home to Chicago, but soon found himself growing restless. This is the Army, where just two years can really pay off. You get two years more confidence and two years more skill. And with Uncle Sam's help, you can get up to $7,400 for college, all in just two years. Your Army recruiter can tell you how to qualify. This is the Army, a chance to serve your country as you serve yourself. He joined the Army for a year and then moved around before finally settling in Las Vegas. Over the years, he did a lot of exploring career-wise, claiming to have had over 200 jobs. None of them seemed to fit quite right. Besides appearing in a few commercials, Paul would go on to play as a stand-in for George Clooney, Mickey Rourke, and he played a small role in the movie Rush Hour 2. Things were going really well for Paul career-wise, and he was lucky in love, too. In the spring of 2005, he met a woman named Michelle on an online dating site. After their first date, the two were inseparable. Michelle loved Paul's warm-hearted, sweet, down-to-earth nature. She noticed he didn't talk a lot about his childhood, and it took some time before he opened up to her about how he was kidnapped. It was a lot to take in, and the way Paul told it was very matter-of-fact. I was kidnapped as a baby, I went missing for a few years, the FBI found me, and I was returned to my parents. End of story. Michelle said that it seemed like Paul was always in search of something, going from Chicago to Arizona, back to Chicago, and everywhere in between. But when they got married in 2008, it seemed to steady and ground Paul. He was at peace, fulfilled. So who do you have there, Michelle? In 2009, Paul and Michelle welcomed their daughter, Emma, into the world. Now Paul wasn't just responsible for himself. He had someone who needed and depended on him. When their obstetrician asked about their family's medical histories, it hit Paul that he didn't really know the answer. And sure, it was a question he had been asked plenty of times. And up until that point, he had always rattled off the same answer. But this time was different. And because it directly impacted his daughter, it made him think twice on how he should answer it. Because what if it wasn't true? What if he wasn't Paul? 
the child who had been found 2,000 miles away from his home. What were the odds of that actually happening? He thought back to his childhood and how his brother David seemed to have an easier relationship with their parents. Paul wondered if it was because they had doubts as to whether he was really their son. He often found himself going back to the photo taken of him, his parents, and the FBI agents who had helped find him. It always stood out to him how in the picture, his dad is looking at him, almost as if he's wondering, is this really my son? I've looked at this picture over and over, and while I can understand what Paul is saying, it also could be that his dad just wasn't ready for the photo. Likewise, his dad could still be in shock. They had finally found their son after 15 long months. I'd love to hear what you think. But it wasn't just that. Dave looked exactly like Chester. Mannerisms, facial expressions, build, everything. But Paul didn't look like either of his parents. Going back to the day Dora and Chester flew to New Jersey to see if the missing baby was their son, I mentioned earlier that there was a lot on the line. And they only had the newborn photos taken of baby Paul in the hospital to go off of. It's not like they got to spend a ton of time with them. We all know how much we change looks-wise from birth to even a few weeks old. And Dora and Chester are being asked to decide if this toddler is their son, their son that they didn't even get to spend a full day with. I imagine that pressure had to be insurmountable. And I think Dora wanted more than anything for it to be her baby. Was he the real Paul Franzak? Paul wanted to know. A simple DNA test would provide him with the answer. And once he made up his mind, he let his parents know what he was going to do. So, one evening in 2012, Paul, Dora, and Chester all sat around the kitchen table and collected their DNA. A quick mouth swab and it was off to the lab. A few days later though, Dora and Chester changed their minds. They didn't want to know. They asked Paul not to send it in. In their hearts, Paul was theirs. Paul wasn't doing this to hurt them. He loved his parents, he loved his upbringing, and he loved his childhood, but he wanted to know for himself. The answer would come in the form of a phone call while he was at work one day. It was from a company called Identigene. The voice on the other end asked, is this Paul Franzak? The next words out of the man's mouth would again alter the course of Paul's life forever. He said, there's no remote possibility that you're Paul Franzak. Chester and Dora are not your biological parents. Imagine getting a call like that while you're at work. If he's not the real Paul Franzak, then who is he? And where is the real Paul? Paul officially knew nothing about his life. He didn't know how old he was. He didn't know his birthday. He didn't know where he was born and he didn't know who his biological parents were. What does he do now? Where do you even begin to start searching for answers? Paul did what so many of us do when we're looking for help and we're looking for it in a large scale way. He turned to the media. He approached investigative journalist George Knapp, who was based in Las Vegas, to help him get his story out to the public. In the meantime, he had to break the news to Chester and Dora the people that had raised him and loved him, the people who asked him not to go through with the DNA test. In an email to them, he wrote, Dear Mom and Dad, First, I am your son and I always will be. You and Dad have been wonderful parents and have shaped me to the person I am today. I love you both and that will be forever. The DNA results came back and it turns out that I am not your biological son. I am not the kidnapped baby that you had stolen from your arms. This means the real Paul Joseph Franzek may still be out there, alive, not knowing who he is. I want to find out if the real Paul Franzek is alive and what happened to him. And I want to find out who I am and what happened to me. I hope you and Dad will be with me on this and be a part of this process. Thank you for all you have done for me in the past and for the rest of our future together. Your loving son, Paul. If you're thinking that an email was not the way to go, you're not alone. Something like that should probably be done in person, but I feel like Paul couldn't bring himself to have that face-to-face conversation with his parents. 
and I don't blame him. How do you sit your parents down and tell them something this heavy knowing they asked you not to submit the DNA results? It's a situation I wouldn't want to be in. Dora and Chester were beside themselves. They were hurt. How could Paul do this to them? Were they not good enough parents to him? For a long time, Dora, Chester, and his brother David were upset, hurt, and angry with Paul. So much so that it caused a rift in the family that would last for nearly three years. Through all their pain, it was hard for any of them to see the other's side. Paul couldn't understand why they wouldn't want to get to the bottom of the real Paul's disappearance. And Dora, Chester, and David didn't understand why they weren't enough for him. Even Paul's wife, Michelle, wanted him to let this go, but he couldn't. In the end, it would be Paul's obsession with solving this case that would be the downfall of their marriage. In April of 2013, his story with George Knapp aired. The response was overwhelming. Calls came pouring in, and major news outlets wanted to hear directly from Paul. In March of 2014, he even appeared on 2020 with Barbara Walters. For Paul, this was a win. The more attention his story got, the better chance he had of finding his true identity and finding the real Paul Franzak. Here's Barbara Walters. Good evening. Tonight, a most bizarre story. What would you do if everything you thought you knew about your life was a lie? And the real truth was more incredible than anything you could have imagined. Well, one man is telling that very story about the suspicions and the family secrets that have haunted him for the last 50 years. Genetic genealogist C. C. Moore heard about his story and reached out suggesting further DNA testing. They uploaded Paul's DNA to Ancestry, 23andMe, and Family Tree. She also got Paul in touch with DNA researchers Carol Relnick, Michelle Trossler, and Allison Dembski, who helped people put together their family trees using DNA. And that's exactly what they were going to help Paul do. What they didn't know was that it would take years to piece together. The first lead they found was a man named Alan Fish, who was technically Paul's second cousin. This was a great place to start because it meant they shared great grandparents. Paul reached out to Alan and thankfully, he was just as excited as Paul was. They agree to meet in New York to exchange family information. You'd think from here, the missing pieces would fall into place for Paul, right? Well, not exactly. You see, Alan was adopted. This meant that in order to solve Paul's family history, they had to solve Alan's too. Because Alan had been legally adopted, that meant records could be obtained listing who Alan's birth mother was, and possibly even his father things were looking up again. Until a few days before Alan and Paul were scheduled to meet. Alan woke up not feeling well. It was enough to make him want to go to the hospital. A few hours later, he was dead. How could this happen? Paul's about to meet his first biological family member ever, and now he's gone. Now, Paul's team of DNA researchers were still able to get Alan's adoption records unsealed and find out who his biological mother was. Alan's biological mother was very young when she fell pregnant. That meant that Alan's biological father was most likely someone his mother went to school with or someone who lived nearby. Thankfully, a man by the name of Lenny Rocco appeared on Alan's genetic network. He was a boxer and doo-wop singer in the 50s who lived in the area around the time Alan was born. Lenny was 15 when he had an extremely brief encounter with Alan's mother. And even though their encounter was brief and only occurred once, she fell pregnant. But Lenny never knew that. Sadly, he wouldn't learn about the existence of his son Alan until nearly a year after Alan had passed. Even though Paul and Alan could no longer meet, it didn't mean all hope was lost because Lenny and Paul could still connect. Lenny shared about 6% of Paul's DNA, meaning one of Lenny's first cousins should be one of Paul's birth parents. Paul's team hones in on two of Lenny's cousins, Gilbert and Leonard. Now, Gilbert was dead and Leonard had disappeared, but they were still able to get in touch with Leonard's ex-wife, Lynn. They crossed their fingers and hoped that she'd be willing to talk to them. 
and she was. Lynn was able to give them critical information about Gilbert and his wife Marie. You see, they were a private couple who mainly kept to themselves. Now, the couple had three children, and they also had a set of twins, a boy and a girl, who, get this, were around the same age as Paul. Lynn and Leonard would pay visits to Gilbert and Marie. She said one year the twins were there, and the next year they weren't. And nobody knew where they were. So now we're trying to figure out the identity of a man who believed he was Paul Franzek for decades. We're trying to figure out where the real Paul Franzek is and what happened to the missing twins. This, this is straight out of the pages of a mystery novel. The biggest revelation was about the missing twins. What can be found out about them? Gilbert's sister-in-law, Lynn, always remembered the twins' birthday. You see, they had been born on their older sister's birthday, and because it was such a bizarre coincidence, the local newspaper had even published an article about it. And we have their names, Jack and Jill. Was it possible that Paul was the missing twin boy? Paul's team of researchers sure thought so. In the span of one conversation taking place on June 3rd, 2015, Paul would not only learn that his real name was Jack Thomas Rosenthal, but he'd also learn that he had a twin sister. But nobody knew where she was. Talk about your whole life being turned upside down. This was information that would once again alter the course of Paul's life forever. Paul would learn that he was actually six months older than what he thought he was. He was born on October 27, 1963, in a hospital in Atlantic City. Besides having a twin, Paul would also learn that he had two older sisters and a younger brother. And while he was able to connect with his younger brother for a short time, his brother would ultimately cut off communication, saying he felt as if the whole thing was a scam. Out of his two older sisters, one had died, and the other was willing to communicate with Paul, but was extremely tight-lipped and guarded about what she knew. Why would Gilbert and Marie choose to keep some of their children and get rid of two? Paul's second cousin, Toby Dresner, who would have been Gilbert's first cousin, helped fill in some of the missing pieces. She said that growing up, Gilbert was a good person. They spent many summers on the boardwalk, playing at the beach, and swimming in the ocean. But all that would change when Gilbert got a bit older. You see, in June of 1950, the United States officially entered the Korean War. Nearly 1.8 million American soldiers were called to serve. Gilbert was one of them. When he returned home from Korea, he was a different person. He had seen, heard, and was subjected to unspeakable things. Back then, they called it shell shock. Today, we know it as PTSD. And while this doesn't excuse any of Gilbert's behavior or decisions, it does help shed light on who he was as an adult. Paul would also gain insight from one of their old neighbors who lived next door to the family in Atlantic City, a woman named Susan. Susan had been 14 or 15 years old when Marie asked her to babysit for them one evening. When Susan showed up, Marie gave her the rundown. She told Susan that the two little girls could eat anything they wanted and wherever they chose to sleep for the night would be fine. Marie also told her that she wouldn't need to bother with the twins upstairs. Twins? What twins? Even though Susan lived next door to the family, she was shocked to find out they had twins. Where had they been keeping them? And why didn't Gilbert and Marie want Susan caring for them? Something wasn't right. As soon as Gilbert and Marie left, Susan went upstairs and found the twins' room. The only thing in it was two cribs. No toys, no rocking chair, no changing table. She said the room smelled like ammonia and the sheets in the two cribs were covered in urine stains. Walking up to the twins, she could immediately see they were dirty and Jack had a black eye. Another thing that stood out to her is how afraid the twins looked. For most babies, when they see a person walk in the room, they get excited. But Jack and Jill didn't do that. They just sat there silently. Susan said she stayed in the room with the twins all night. 
Gilbert and Marie didn't come home until the next day. And when they did, they were furious with her because she tended to the twins. Susan said she specifically recalled that it was Marie who seemed the most angry and remembered that Marie smelled like alcohol. When Susan went home, she confided in her mom about what she had seen. But her mom told her it wasn't her place to say anything. It wasn't her business. Susan said all her life she wondered what had happened to the twins next door. It was easier for her to believe that they went and lived with relatives where they would be loved and well cared for. How could Gilbert and Marie be so cruel? With their two older daughters, they were lenient enough to allow them to have whatever they wanted to eat in the house and they could sleep anywhere they wanted for the night, whether it be their own beds or on the living room floor. Yet with the twins, who were still in cribs, they didn't care if they were fed or had their diapers changed. Even though Paul's siblings were tight-lipped and closed off about what they knew, the few conversations he did manage to have with other biological family members painted a grim picture. One cousin shared their memory of seeing the twins sitting in a cage. Other family members would say that the twins were always crying. Paul would later learn that his mother Marie was an abusive alcoholic, and his father Gilbert worked in law enforcement in Atlantic City. He allegedly had connections to mobster Nicky Scarfo and made a lot of enemies, so much so that when he died, nobody went to his funeral, not even his wife Marie. Both Gilbert and Marie would die in the 90s of cancer without ever revealing what had happened to their twins. That was a secret they were taking to their grave. Paul had always felt that something was missing from his life. Was that missing piece his twin sister? We know that twins share a special connection. So did he instinctively know that he was missing his other half? And speaking of Jill, where was she? Paul felt that something bad had to have happened to her, and that's why they gave him away. But was it also possible that they put each twin in a stroller and left them outside different stores, perhaps in different towns? Now, while all this was going on, the DNA researchers were also working on finding the real Paul. Because this was being publicized in the news, phone calls and letters from people all over who believed they could be Paul Joseph Franzak, the baby who was taken from Michael Reese Hospital, poured in. It's a nearly 50-year-old case, now reopened by the FBI. We're going to do everything that we can to follow up to see if that baby is out there. I feel kind of like an imposter because I'm using his birth certificate and I want to give it to him and then I want to find mine. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children created this age progression image. Several men have come forward believing they may be the real stolen baby. I do believe that there's a chance of me being Paul Franzak. But none of them panned out. Until three daughters in Michigan became convinced their father was the real Paul Franzak. A DNA test would later confirm their suspicions were correct. Four hours north of Chicago, in the small town of Manton, Michigan, a man named Kevin Beatty would also have his life completely turned upside down after spending 55 years believing he knew his life story. He was stunned to learn that his mother, Lorraine, wasn't his biological mother when one of his daughters took a DNA test in hopes of learning more about the family. When the results came back, it showed that she had a relative that she'd never heard of. Further research would lead her to the story of the baby kidnapped from Michael Reese Hospital. Their dad, Kevin Beatty, had been raised by a single mom. Was Lorraine the woman who had taken him from the hospital? There wasn't a lot of information for them to go off of. So how did he end up in Michigan? Beatty's stepbrother tells WGN Investigates Beatty's mother was dating a doctor in Chicago when she abruptly moved to Arkansas for a year or so and returned with the baby who grew up as Kevin. Was she capable of abducting a child? And while their grandmother Lorraine had died several years before, what they did know was that she was a good woman and she loved her son dearly. This revelation came at the same time the real Paul was diagnosed with stage four cancer and it spread fast. Within a year, he had passed, but not before he was able to connect with his biological mother, Dora, in late 2019. And while they never got to meet in person, they were able to speak twice over the phone and learn a little about each other's lives. 
Dora would say the whole thing was surreal. On one hand, she's talking to her son, but on the other hand, she was talking to a complete stranger. At the end of the day, she knew her son was loved and lived a good life. The last time they would speak was in December, when he would call Dora to wish her a Merry Christmas. While we don't know for sure who the fake nurse was that stole baby Paul in April of 1964, there has been speculation. Many believe it was a woman named Linda Taylor, the notorious welfare queen of Chicago, and the evidence is quite compelling. One anonymous tipster said she had many, many schemes to get money and would have most likely sold the baby. Even her own son, Johnny Harbaugh, believes she stole baby Paul, saying, My mother was capable of anything, not only stealing a baby, but she could steal you. She was just that kind of woman. You know, she'd done whatever it took for her to survive. After being shown a photo of one-day-old baby Paul, Johnny claims that he saw this baby for the first time when his mother brought him home one day in 1964. He remembers playing with the baby, who they nicknamed Tiger. Now, Linda was known as a master of disguise. It's been said that she could pass as Caucasian, Black, Asian, and Latina. She had 100 different aliases and 50 fake addresses. Do you think that's your mother? Except for the nose, but she could do anything with her face or her hair. The woman was just a chameleon. She, she could be anything. According to her son, she even had a room in their home dedicated entirely to her wigs and disguises, which, get this, included nurses and doctors' uniforms. It's believed the extent of her criminal activity was broad. We're talking assault, theft, bigamy, and even murder. The woman has been accused of committing countless crimes. In 1977, her schemes and lies eventually caught up with her. In the 1970s, when Linda Taylor was put on trial for welfare fraud... Miss Taylor, can we talk to you for a moment? She actually came under investigation for stealing the Franzak baby. She was found guilty of multiple counts of welfare fraud and sentenced to two to six years for claiming public assistance, social security, and veterans benefits by using fake identities. It was actually during the trial that she first became a suspect in the abduction of baby Paul. Even one of her ex-husbands said that she showed up one day in the 60s with a newborn baby boy despite never having been pregnant. But Linda would never admit to the kidnapping. According to Johnny, he came home from school one day and Tiger was gone. His mother never gave him any explanation. He believed that one of his mother's boyfriends took Tiger to Tennessee. What do you think? Do the original composite sketches resemble Linda Taylor? I want to share with you what Dora would say to Paul years later when she was able to open up more. When her and Chester were in New Jersey and waiting to meet the little boy that had been found outside the department store, she said they had a decision to make. There was a child in front of I thought it was really beautiful and captures where her and her husband's hearts were back then. Paul continues to search for his missing twin, Jill. Before the pandemic, his search for her took him and his team to a home in New Jersey that once belonged to his grandmother. While there, they found a number of potential grave sites and were able to exhume some of the remains. However, analysis of the bones determined them to be animal, which is technically good news. Jill could still be out there, and Paul isn't going to stop looking for her anytime soon. He said, I can't give up because eventually someone who knows something is going to talk. He has filed a missing persons case with New Jersey's police and has even had mock-ups and age progression photos of his sister created. If you have any information about the disappearance of Jill Rosenthal or recognize the woman in these photos, contact the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children at 1-800-THE-LOST. If you enjoyed today's video, give it a thumbs up and hey, while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss out on the next investigation. And I'm off to check my birth certificate. <laughs>